What's shaking, everybody? You're listening to a bonus episode of Improv Tabletop, the show that's usually a TTRPG actual play, but we're back with more Choose Your Own Adventure book times. I'm Ned Wilcock, your host and GM, and today I'm joined by... Thomas Ryan. And Evan Peterson. Which can only mean one thing. It's time to get back into the Cave of Time. The Cave of Time! <sighs> Woo! Because it made so much sense when we entered the cave of time last time. I'm starting to think I actually went in the cave of time because I thought I was done with this and now I've looped back around. <laughs> you took a wrong turn, bud. I'm Groundhog Day yeah. in it. Yeah, the problem is the gods that dictate what kind of time loops happen in this podcast world are our patrons and our fans. <laughs> and they have determined that it's time to go back into the cave of time. Uh, did I make it sound like I wasn't excited to be here? No, uh, I love the cave of time. Are you sure it was our patrons or was it something that was the same size as our patrons, but it wasn't? <laughs> oh, but it looked completely different. Yeah. <laughs> I can never forget that. I want to, and I can't. <laughs> Uh, such is the life of a time traveler. <laughs> well, speaking of time traveling, I suppose we might as well start back kind of at the beginning because we took a few different forks going down that path. Mm -hmm. Let's try taking a different fork and see where that leads us all kinds of crazy places. So we're going to go to the very first decision point. You wonder how long you've been in the cave. You are not hungry. You don't feel you've been sleeping. You wonder whether to try to walk back home by moonlight or whether to wait for dawn rather than risk losing your footing on the steep and rocky trail. And so initially we decided to start back home, I believe, because we were doing our no cave strat and that worked out so well for us, yeah. obviously. <laughs> the no cave strat, which immediately resulted in us going right back into the cave. <laughs> Yeah, hey, we got to ride a mammoth. <laughs> so I think this time, if we're going down a different path, we're going to wait. So we wait until morning. It's a strong start. Mm -hmm. Just waiting. <laughs> yeah, got to go slow. <laughs> <laughs> you wait until morning, but as the rosy wisps of dawn begin to light the eastern sky, a chill and forbidding wind begins to blow. If you seek shelter, turn to page six. If you brave the freezing wind to see more of the world about you, turn to page 16. Well, I assume seeking shelter means in the cave of time. Are we going to continue with our no cave <laughs> I think, strat? I think we should switch gears and go only cave strat. Cave Anytime only. Anytime we go only. back into the cave, we should. <laughs> yes. All right, let's take shelter. Cave Any strat. percent cave only. <laughs> you step into a niche in the rocks to escape the merciless blast of wind and lean back against the rock wall. Suddenly, it crumbles under your weight, causing you to fall backward down a muddy slope and into a pond. The sun shines brightly down on you as you pick yourself up, dripping wet, and wade to the grassy shore. You look back at the rock rising out of the pond, but you can't see where you fell through. While you are collecting your senses, a horse comes prancing up. Here we are, time horse. Already. Woo, time horse! <laughs> A horse comes prancing up, its rider dressed in tin armor, a Ooh. knight out of the history books, enough to make you laugh. Ugh. The horseman lifts off his helmet and laughs himself. What a place for a bath, he calls out. Well, it was worth it. You're cleaner than a pig. He almost falls off his horse, he is laughing so hard. I don't see the humor in this situation. <laughs> <laughs> but climb on and I'll take you back to the castle, he says. Look. I didn't want to show my ignorance, but like he said, what a place for a bath. But like in medieval times, wasn't any body of water an actual place for a bath? I guess so. <laughs> I mean, knights, knights had better accommodations than like peasant folk, right? So they probably did have a proper bathroom or something. Oh, so he's calling and, us poor. <laughs> essentially. And depending on where we are in the world, because I don't know if it's a space and time cave or just a time cave. <laughs> this very well could be somewhere that has bathhouses. Yeah, there's also a non-zero chance that this is a transmogrifying cave because he says you're cleaner than a pig. And then the last thing he says is, we'll see if we can make a human out of you yet. So are we like actually a pig right now? <laughs> no, we're just lower class filth. Well, I guess I should clarify. We can't be a pig because we're cleaner than a pig. Mm -hmm. We're the same size as a pig, <laughs> but not the same cleanliness. Maybe he's just Perfect. confused because like pig is what he calls the poor folk. And he's like, you're cleaner than a pig. Hmm. So we're getting into the class war portion <laughs> of the Cave of Time. So do we accept the ride back to the castle or do we decline the invitation and try to find our way back into the Cave of Time? Let's go to the castle. Uh, we're doing a cave only strat. Don't yeah. want to spoil your fun here, but we got to get true. back to the cave. Yeah. 
Let's go back to the cave. All right, so we head back to the cave, and the knight rides off with a boombox playing Castle by Macklemore. Wow. Uh, there, <laughs> okay. It's a decent song. Sure, yeah. Just, they they I, really predicted the, the future when they wrote this one. <laughs> it's actually yeah. the far distant future. Mm-hmm. There is a gracious tone in the knight's laughter that does not inspire your trust, so you thank him <laughs> graciously and tell him you have other business to attend to. <laughs> so then sorry, knight. I can't stick around. Then go to it, the knight replies. Take care of your business drier than yourself. Uh, he gallops off in a rush. You are glad to be rid of him. Eager to find the entrance to the Cave of Time, you climb back behind the rock wall. You, yeah, you climb up behind the rock wall that slopes into the pond. After searching for an hour, you find a tunnel leading underground. You follow the tunnel downward a short distance, and suddenly you are sliding. Your head strikes something and you are knocked unconscious. Oh boy. When you wake up, you find yourself by a small lake bordered by woods. A boy about 12 years old is fishing nearby, but there is no one else in sight. You go up and introduce yourself, hoping you can find out what year it is without sounding crazy. Fortunately, the boy is friendly and good-natured. He tells you his name is Nick Tyler and that he lives on Birch Street. He works in his father's business making candles and soap. The best in the colonies, he says. I'm starting to think the cave strat just means we get like a, a <laughs> hit of like, oh, you could have had an adventure. And then you go off to the next could have had an adventure. Mm -hmm. I know best in the colonies is like isn't even the most unreasonable thing to say. But I like the idea that each person we meet is just going to be like, oh, boy, what a beautiful day here in uh, 1812. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, what a beautiful day here in medieval England. <laughs> so, do we want to tell Nick Tyler from Birch Street that we come from a future time, or do we try to make up a, quote, believable story, unquote? Future I 100% guarantee if we tell him we're from a future time, we're getting burned at the stake. Yeah, let's do it. Ooh, to this is the colonies. We're just this crazy dude in weird clothes who says he's from the future. We're getting burned at the stake. Witchcraft strat. Witchcraft. Right. <laughs> let's go running to the burning stake. When you tell him you come from the 20th century through the cave of time, Nick smiles. Then you tell him a little about life in your own time, about cars and planes, telephones and television. He listens intently with a big grin on his face as if you were telling the funniest story ever told. Why does everybody think my situation is funny? I'm so glad to meet you, Nick says. I've always wanted to know about life in the 20th century. He tries to look serious but begins to laugh, thinking it's all a joke. Seriously, you say, since you know he will never believe you, I have no home. Do you know of a place where I can stay? Uh, I probably need to give this guy a colony sort of accent. I'm sure you can come stay at our house, he says warmly. We have such a big family, one more won't matter, but you must be willing to work in the shop with the rest of us. Since you feel you hardly have any other choice, you accept his offer and feel grateful when his parents give you a good dinner and a comfortable bet. Comfortable bet? Probably a comfortable bed. <laughs> Nick tells you with much seriousness that you are living in the year 1718 in Boston, the principal town in the British colony of Massachusetts. You soon become one of the family. They are good people and treat you well. But each day you have to do long hours boiling soap and pouring it into molds, waiting on customers and doing errands for Nick's father, whom you have come to know as Uncle Ted. Your neighbor, Mr. Nelson, is a printer. He recently returned from England with a printing press and a letter type he bought there. The business interests you, and you consider working as an apprentice, but to do so, you would have to sign papers indenturing yourself to work faithfully for him for six full years. Do we decide to stay at home and continue to work for Uncle Ted, or do we decide to, quote, be indentured to be an apprentice in Mr. Nelson's printing business, unquote? I think I would have preferred burning at the stake. That was so <laughs> This is insane. Why... Why in every scenario that he ends up in a new time, he's like, and then I stayed there, and that was the rest of my life. Right. He never tries to go yeah. back home. <laughs> that was such a leap. I was like, well, do we tell him we're from the future or not? Yeah, I guess we'll tell him. Cool. Do you want to be indentured as a printing apprentice for the next six years? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Oh, man. This guy has a terrible home life. Let's um, uh, let's let's do it. Yeah, let's, let's indenture ourselves. Let's become an apprentice. All right. You go to work in Mr. Nelson's shop and soon become proficient in the art of printing. But after a while, you become increasingly unhappy. Mr. Nelson refuses to raise your wages or give you a chance to own part of the business. There are no jobs available for you in Boston, so you decide to move to Philadelphia, where you have heard there is a greater demand for printing. Happily, Mr. Nelson agrees to release you from your indenture, and by selling almost all your possessions, you are able to raise enough money to engage passage <laughs> on a coastal schooner. This guy has terrible business acumen if he's like, you're going to be in my apprentice for six years. Oh, you want to go off and become one of my competitors? Have fun. Go go find a schooner. 
Uh, <laughs> Go find a schooner. After a long and stormy voyage down the coast, your ship docks early on a Sunday morning at the Market Street Wharf in Philadelphia. You are tired and hungry, and you use some of your last money to buy a loaf of bread. Out of curiosity, you follow some well-dressed people into the Quaker Meeting House. The people seat themselves, but following custom, no one speaks. It's so peaceful, you fall sound asleep. When you awaken, the Quakers welcome you. One family gives you lodging, and fortunately, you are able to get a job with one of the two printers in town. Things are looking pretty decent for us, I suppose. You work hard to improve your skills as a printer. Within a few years, with the help of some friends, you're able to raise enough money to go into business on your own. The printing business thrives, and after a while, you start your own newspaper. It begins to look as if the 18th century is a pretty good time for you to be alive. The end. That's a skunk. Yeah. Skunk of an ending. What? Skunk of an ending. Why are we... You go into the printing business and you don't print a book about the future? Sci-fi has been a yeah. genre forever and you would have, like, real-life proof. Uh, I just... I thought the point... I thought the point of this book was going to be, like, <laughs> trying to get back from time periods. <laughs> no, it's all just like, and then I stayed there. <laughs> we were like, we need to try and find our way back to the cave. That was our choice. And all that happened was we immediately jumped times again and decided we're going to live here. <laughs> I mean, no offense to anybody who, as a younger child, wanted to own a newspaper when you grew up, but that sounds boring to me. I'm just, why didn't he die of, like, a cold or a scratch or something? I feel like that was a more yeah. realistic ending. Or get burned at the stake. Or that burned at the stake. Exciting. He happened to find the one kid in the colonies who wasn't like, oh, you're not Catholic, are you? And then... Or Protestant, not Catholic. Yeah. Catholics didn't have a foothold yet. Kid didn't snitch. He's cool. Should we just mark this one down as a skunk? Mm -hmm. Ah, yeah. That one's a skunk. Definitely a skunk. Okay. We'll go back a little bit. Uh, we get to the decision point of staying at home to work for Uncle Ted instead of being indentured. Uh, Thomas, I should also say, if this book was concerned with realism, we would have slaughtered way more entire civilizations with our modern diseases. So I think it's probably good we're putting uh, realism by the wayside for a moment. Well, the one thing I look for in my uh, time caves is realism. And uh, I'm a little disappointed that there isn't more If my more choose of that. your own adventure books aren't realistic. The last one we did was about a space vampire, and it was so realistic. Yeah, here's some nice realism for you. Although you feel you would probably enjoy the printing business more than a career as a soap maker, you wish to remain free to take advantage of some other opportunity. Your work with Uncle Ted is tedious. You feel you could not bear life devoted to making candles and soap. You spend most of your spare time reading what books you can lay hold of, but you're anxious to travel and see the world. Not long afterwards, you sign up on the brigantine Nina as a deckhand. The ship is owned by a rich merchant and it is bound for Barbados in the West Indies with a load of lumber and then on to England. You find life at sea much harder than you expected, especially when you requ are required to climb the rigging in a howling gale, but eventually you become captain of your own ship. <laughs> in every place you visit, you ask the people you meet whether they've ever heard of the Cave of Time. The what? end. That is such a huge... That's like... <laughs> that's like a montage of his life. It's like, you get on a boat. Now you're a captain of your own boat. They skip the whole middle part where you learn how to captain a boat and then get the money to pay for a boat and then buy your own boat and then become the captain of your boat. And it's such a great narrative thread when you get to the point where it's like, hey, you get a job on a boat. We're not going to give you the opportunity to explore now that you have that boat. We're just going to end the story. You now have freedom to go anywhere in the current time. The end. <laughs> and you do. You do it a lot. There's so many adventures. It's really great. Bye. <laughs> All right. We already have one tick in missed potential. I feel like this could fit there as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't remember what that tick was originally for, but this fits. That one was originally for Abe Lincoln because we didn't give him a heads up. <laughs> but then we changed Abe Lincoln to justifiable guilt. Oh, that's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, Going back through the the pages with all the fingers stuck in them. We were so close to being a pirate. We were so close. We were in the West Indies. We had a boat. We're so naive. Working on a ship so much harder than I thought it would be. What do you think it would be? Huh? You're working on a ship it's as a deckhand. 18th century, man. <laughs> That's hard. <laughs> yeah. 
All right, so we've come to the decision point of do we tell Nick Tyler on Birch Street that we come from the future or try to make up a believable story? What's the believable? So, if the believable story gets us burnt at the stake, yeah. I'm going to be so mad. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> All right, let's see what happens. You do your best to make up a story about how you ran away from home, but Nick sees that you are not telling him the truth. While you're talking, he packs up his fishing gear, says goodbye, and walks off. Once he's out of sight, you start down the road, and after a mile or so, reach a settled area. While you're standing near a church, wondering what to do next, a constable approaches and asks you where you're from. No way. This time, you try to explain what really happened. After listening a while, he arrests you for disorderly conduct no way. and locks you up in the local jail. The moral of the story I'm seeing so far is don't lie to strangers, kids. <laughs> Later in the day, a big stupid looking guard comes to bring you a ration of soup and bread. He is fascinated by your strange clothes and by the rumors he has heard about you. After opening the door to your cell, he hands you your food and stands back and looks at you curiously. They say you're in league with the devil, he says. <laughs> no is <that> way! So? <laughs> this cannot be happening. <laughs> Our options here, do we want to run past the guard and escape, or do we tell him we're innocent? <laughs> we're burnt to the stake no matter what happens at this point. In, in a plot twist, I cannot believe. I can't believe we're actually <laughs> being accused of being in league with the devil. Okay, so... <laughs> Well, that's what happens. You lied, so you're in league with the devil, oh right? Lying to gosh. Not burnt at the stake, Strat. Uh, I think we make a run no, for it. No, burnt at the stake. We need. I need to see if this ends in us getting burnt at the stake. All right. Well, which one do we think is more likely okay. to get us burnt at the stake? I think if we tell them we're innocent, we will get burnt at the stake. I've got a good feeling about that. All right. Let's do it. When you tell the guard you are innocent, he scowls and slams shut the door of the cell. You'll not take me to the devil with you, he calls back as he walks away. The next day, you are brought into a courtroom before a stern-looking judge. After hearing the charges against you and listening to what you have to say, he shakes his head and scowls angrily. Then he looks at the prosecutor and pounds his fist on the bench. Your charge against this person is for disorderly conduct, but the specifications you give are strange clothes and telling stories invented by the devil. What you really are charging is witchcraft. <laughs> There will be no such madness in my court, and let me have none of it from you. Case dismissed. <laughs> this is bananas. We told him the truth, and we didn't get burnt at the stake. We had a long life as either a pirate or a printing press man. Ooh. But we, we try and tell a believable lie, and we are, you know, accused of witchcraft. That's incredible. The judge not only sets you free, but afterwards gives you a home to live in and helps you on your way to a good and happy life in the 18th century. Why? The end. Wait, what? What? That's a happy ending. <laughs> Hold on. So wait, he says, it sounds more like you're doing witchcraft. Have freedom. <laughs> That's it? <laughs> exactly. Here, have a house. Well, he doesn't believe in witchcraft. Exactly. His whole thing, he was like, you're, what you're really accusing is a witchcraft. He's basically accusing the constable yeah. of using a different charge because the constable knows it's witchcraft, but he's like, oh, the judge won't go for witchcraft, so we're going to call it disorderly conduct. Mm -hmm. You just don't understand the politics of Choose Your Own Adventure books. They're very layered, very complex yeah. storytelling it's, here. It's like an onion. Like an ogre. <laughs> So oh, we have one more option to try and get burned at the stake. Yeah, we gotta we run. try and run past the guard. Run past skip? the guard. Yeah, that guard's going to get pissed. Okay. The guard is too startled and maybe even too afraid to stop you as you dart past him and out of the jailhouse. It just works. You run down the street as fast as you can. <laughs> as you stop to catch your breath, a thin bearded man driving a coach pulls up to you. You seem to be in some trouble, he calls out. Can I be of help? This doesn't seem to be leading us to the stake. I mean, I guess it's a children's book, right? <laughs> yeah. They're probably not going to. And then you're strapped to the stake and burned alive. <laughs> the end. Go back to the next standing for Cave of Time. While the priest splashes holy water at you, screaming, the power of Christ compels you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Too tired to make up any story, you begin to tell him everything that has happened to you. He is very excited by your story and invites you to a nearby tavern where you have your first good meal since you left Red Creek Ranch. Your host hardly eats anything. He looks pale and seems to have a bad cough. Oh my gosh. Oh, buddy. We're getting consumption. When you have finished recounting <laughs> your tale, he says, It is strange that we have met. I have tuberculosis. <laughs> my word. <laughs> How strange we've met. I have tuberculosis. 
<laughs> guess what you have now? <laughs> I have tuberculosis and no doctor in Boston can help me. My only hope is to reach a future time. I think it's my only hope too, you say. If we help each other, I think we can find our way back to your time. My new time, he replies. The two of you shake hands on it. I just want to point out real quick. Consumption is the old-timey word for tuberculosis, so I was dead to go. rights. Oh my gosh, my stomach hurts. Yes, we shake hands on it, a great move for avoiding the contraction of tuberculosis, and we set out on our quest the next day at sunrise. Together, you are successful in finding your way to the present time. Whoa, your friend from the past is cured how? with the help of Wait, modern what did, medicine. What did we do? <laughs> We found our way back to the present time, exactly like, like the book says. We're getting some way bigger plot twists on this run. Holy cow. Yeah. Your friend from the past is cured with help of modern medicines and later becomes a history teacher who is known throughout the country for his amazing knowledge of life in colonial America, the end. Oh my goodness. That is bananas. <laughs> it's like a matter of three paragraphs. It's a good thing we, we met. I have tuberculosis, and I went to a <laughs> doctor, and he was like, I can't help you. So obviously the only solution left is to travel through time, and you went bet, and then you just did. No explanation. <laughs> you just did. You went back to the present and cured him and made him a world-renowned history professor who apparently only knows about one subject of history and mysteriously has a big gap between that, that era and the modern day. <laughs> Yep. I mean, to be fair, history people usually specialize in one, like, turbo-specific field. So, like, modern life in the 18th century, that could totally happen. I think I'm going to mark this ending under Shyamalan. Beautiful. <laughs> oh, we did forget to choose what kind of ending our... What kind of ending it was when we got that house from that judge. Shyamalan. <laughs> Shyamalan also. The miscarriage of justice ending? <laughs> yeah. Why wasn't I burnt at the stake? Yeah, I mean, th that I think that's all of the potential paths we could have gone down to try and get burnt at the stake, and nothing worked. No. How disappointing. We had every opportunity. We were in jail, accused of witchcraft, at, like, a judge's place. A courtroom, that's the word for it. And <laughs> <laughs> somehow, with all the evidence of us being from the future, we did not get burnt at the stake. Despite our best efforts, our caves only strat has not led us to being burned alive. Yeah. However, I'm sticking to the no cave strat. Yeah. If we ride back to the castle with the knight, there's a chance we might get burned at the stake. All right. Burnt at the stake run. Any percent. Let's yeah. go. The laughing knight helps you up onto his horse and you sit uncomfortably as it canters over the countryside. After traveling a mile or so, you come to a great stone castle. The horse trots across the drawbridge and into the stable. Jump, the knight calls to you, and you slide off the rear of the horse. The knight escorts you into the grand chamber of the castle. All about you are stewards, attendants, and knights. A few minutes later, you find yourself bowing before the king himself. After hearing your story, the king looks gravely at his advisors and knights and stewards. Does anyone believe this tale? he asks. Everyone cries back, No, your majesty, or certainly not, your majesty. Then tell us the truth, the king roars at you. We're off to a good start for getting yeah, burned at the stake. Yeah. This is sounding very promising. If you insist you are telling the truth, turn to page 36. Otherwise, we can try to make up a, quote, plausible story, unquote. I don't know what to do anymore, because the plausible story got us closer to burnt last time. It didn't follow through, though, is the problem. We're going to, like, insist we're telling the truth, and the king's going to be like, fine, show me the present. And then it's going to be like, you go back to the present. The king lives with you. It's great. The end. You and the king become homies. He becomes the new president. He sounds angry. He sounds like an angry king. I think if we go insist, he's just going to go ballistic. Yeah, he's not like the kid laughing at us like we're telling a joke. He's gonna sick the hounds on you or something. Let's insist we're telling the truth. Alright. I know it sounds strange, your majesty, you say, but I have no reason to incur your wrath by making up a false story. The king looks around at his courtiers. They have grave expressions on their faces as if you have committed some unpardonable sin. Oh, here Perfect. we go. Yes. This is it. Off to the tower, the king shouts. Two knights leap forward, drag you out of the chamber, and with spears at your back, force you to climb 48 stone steps to the tower prison. In. A tiny cylindrical room with only one window looking out over the moat and pasture land beyond. The only furniture is a bed of straw. You realize you are back in the early days of feudal Europe, where the only laws are the king's whims. You have no idea how long he intends to keep you in the tower. There is one possibility of escape. The water in the moat, about 25 feet, almost directly below your window, is quite deep. 
If you jump out far enough, you should land in the deep water and not be hurt. Do we want to jump into the moat or stay? I think there's a really big if there. <laughs> yeah. Also, mm -hmm. I'm kind of glad we just didn't get thrown in the oublet. We oubliet. Yeah. The, yeah. The, this could have gone a lot worse well, than the, mm -hmm. a room with a view. Water is kind of contrary to burning, so I think probably stay here. Yeah, I don't want mm -hmm. I don't want any water that's going <laughs> to keep me from burning. We're not trying to make yeah. it. We're trying to burn alive. All right. You decide to wait, but soon regret it. Okay. There we go. A guard visits you twice a day and brings you only black bread and water. In a few days, you feel almost too weak to escape, even if you have the chance. But just as you are beginning to despair of ever regaining your freedom, the guard walks in smiling. The king has ordered you out of here, he says. We have a much more important prisoner, a man who insulted the king's horse. He laughs in your face. Insulted the king's horse. A, a worse crime by far than pretending that you're from the future. Neither feels like a crime. Yeah. <laughs> yes, the guard laughs in your face. You don't know whether he's telling the truth or not, but he holds the door and waves you out. You walk down the long flight of stone steps to the main courtyard free again, at least for the moment. The drawbridge is down, and there seems to be nothing in the way of your leaving the castle. There is a splendid black horse tied up near you, probably owned by one of the knights. It occurs to you that you could cover a lot of ground on that horse before anyone realizes what happened. Do we mount the time horse and ride off, or do we ask the king for refuge? More crimes. We we are from a ranch. We should be able to know how to handle a horse. Are we sticking with the burned at the stake strat? Trying. I think we're a little past it. It but keeps I don't giving know. us so much cooler things to do, but I do want to get burnt at the stake. I think let's go with the impulse to ride the time horse because yeah, let's yeah. a crime. steal All the right. horse. In a moment, you are across the bridge and galloping over the countryside, feeling a good deal smarter than the king and his knights. When you pass some shepherds and wave, they wave back. You stop to rest at the cottage of a friendly goat herd who feeds you a good dinner. Do not fear the king, he says. He is a fool who sits and drinks grog all day. His only concern is deciding who to put in the tower. His own knights laugh at him, and he is more likely to fall from his throne than you from your horse. Be off now, and on to merry England. Merry spelled M-E-R-R-I-E. Be on to merry England, for great things await you there. Godspeed and good fortune. Your energies are renewed by good food and drink, and your horse, too, is ready to ride. You thank your host warmly and ride off to new adventures and a new life, almost a thousand years before you are born. The end. I knew it. I knew it. I knew it the second we got our freedom. I was like, we're just going to chill here for the rest of our life. It just stinks so, so much that it gives you these opportunities. Hey, you've got a horse and the entirety of medieval England ahead of you. <laughs> you've got a boat and the entire oceans ahead of you. We're not going to let you see any of that. Those are their own books. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll get to those eventually, I'm sure. Horse of time. This is the cave of time. This mm -hmm. is not pirate adventures or medieval Europe. This is the cave of time. Yes, we've been out of the cave of time for a while. That's true. We haven't uh, been in a cave. Yeah, I cave. thought this was the all cave strat. Yeah, but that was boring, it turns out. Yeah, it didn't get us burned at the stake. There's, there's a chance that we might still get burned at the stake if we ask the king for refuge, because he is a fickle man. That's true. Yeah, we can try. You gain entrance to the king and thank him for letting you out of the tower. Think nothing of it, the king replies. Why is he nice? We would do as much for any villain. We like your spirit, and though your story makes as much sense as a dancing mule, it brought laughter to our eyes. You have, without meaning it, we are sure, performed a service for the king. We thank you. <laughs> what? I, there's like, there's no rules here. You can do whatever you want. <laughs> Everything will work out. Just keep going. We'll see that you have a horse and some pieces of gold, the king continues. Oh my gosh. Go and make your fortune. We command you, though. Come once a year and tell us a story no less amusing than what we have heard from your lips. My lord, you say. My liege, he replies. You ride off, somewhat apprehensive, but intent on making as much of your life as is possible in the year 982. I don't get it. Well, I'm going to just look up the average life expectancy in 982 <laughs> real quick. <laughs> oh, man. I swear as a kid, choose your own adventure books were so like, oh, man, you could die with any choice. You got to be so careful. Like, you know, I always felt like they were dangerous. Like I was walking through a minefield. And this book, you can do anything and it will just end with you live a long, prosperous life in another time period. Have we only died the one time we fell off the cliff with the mammoth? I think that's the only time we've actually perished. Because uh, I remember have two, we have two ticks in death. I think we determined that the thing 
that was the size of a sheep but didn't look like a sheep killed us. Oh, yeah, because that's, that's just right. where it ended. Yeah, that was the end. We also had one where we went to the future and were just bummed out because there wasn't enough choices in our Netflix queue. As you do. Yeah. So the very first Google result that I'm seeing says that in medieval England, life expectancy at birth for boys born to families that owned land was a mere 31.3 years. So if we use that as our absolutely true metric, then if we are intent on making as much of our life as is possible in the year 982, that means we've got a good maybe 20 years ahead of us, depending on how old we are in this book. We could have a midlife crisis. We, we might have just gone through our midlife crisis. <laughs> That was it. But we didn't get burned at the stake, so... I think we got one more castle option. Yeah, we can try and jump out of the tower. Oh, two more oh, then. Yeah. Two more then, because before that, we can try and tell a believable lie. Yeah. So, while we're here in the tower, let's try jumping out. You jump far out and fall faster and faster. You enter the water feet first and hit bottom, but the soft mud receives you gently. In a few seconds, you reach the surface. You swim to the outer banks of the moat, shaken but unharmed. You scramble up the bank and run for the cover of the forest. This is horrible security. Yeah. You walk along the edge of the forest until well out of sight of the castle, then head across the open countryside. You stop a peasant to ask him where you might stay for the night. Walk up that hill and you'll see before you the waters of Loch Ness, he says. You'll find a place there. We're in Scotland. Yeah, I gave this guy the wrong voice. I thought we were in like <laughs> Wales or something. You follow his directions, and seeing some little houses near the lake, proceed toward them. Darkness is setting in, and you are glad you, you are glad when you meet a fisherman who says he will give you shelter for the night. He and his wife are kindly people. They invite you to stay and earn your keep by helping them fish. Do we accept, or we decide to travel on? Accept. Yeah, it's just going to tell us we live our lives out as fishermen and are very content. <laughs> we live on Loch Ness, become the monster. Yeah, I do hope we see the monster. You accept the offer, for you can hardly expect a better life at this point, and soon you begin to enjoy rowing out into the early morning mists and spreading your nets with the neighboring fishermen. One afternoon, as the people are pulling in their boats for the night, your friend Angus McPhee <laughs> raises a cry and points at the water. No way. We're going to see the monster? You look out and see the great head and neck of a sea monster, a huge <gasps> dragon of the lake. Nearby, splinters of wood are floating in the water. That was Sutherland's boat! Angus cries out. It's been a hundred years since the monster has been seen, but now it has returned. She's real. The monster swims away and soon is lost from view in the mists. How could the monster be gone for a hundred years and then return? You ask. Oh, that's not Angus speaking. That was us asking <laughs> Angus. We've been there too <laughs> long. We've the accent. We've lived here too long. <laughs> Uh, somewhere near Betty's Point, he replies. There is an underwater cave where the monster <clears throat> stays as long as it pleases because it is a cave of time. No way. Plot Ooh. twist. Loch Ness Monster is a time traveler in this universe. I gotta be honest, this is our best <laughs> path so far. At least we're going back yeah. to the cave. <laughs> if only you could find your way back to the cave of time. But chances seem slim and the risks seem great. Do we try to find the cave of time or do we not try? Oh, oh, cave, cave strat. Time. We gotta go for the cave this time. <laughs> the Loch Ness Monster's down there. Also, yeah, now I'm even more confident that not going for the cave would just result in a, well, you live happily in old Scotland fishing. So let's at least try and get home, and then we'll have a cool story to tell. Yeah, I just want to say this page where the two options are, if you try and if you do not try, this page would give Yoda a conniption. <laughs> wow. <laughs> One day, when the sun is bright and the water is warm as it'll likely get, you take an old skiff and row to Beatty's Point. You pull your boat up on the rocky shoal that marks the cave. You dive again and again along the rock wall that drops into the depths until you find the entrance. You swim a few feet inside and find you can get up to the surface inside an enormous cavern, most of it filled by an underground lake. You reach the shore and walk along the lakeside deeper and deeper into the cavern, which is lit by a mysterious blue light. Then, ahead, you see what you would hope to find a tunnel that surely must lead to the Cave of Time. Nearby in the sand are three eggs as large as footballs. You pick one up and carry it into the tunnel. After walking a while, the air becomes hard to breathe. You begin to feel dizzy and fall unconscious to the ground, still clutching the enormous egg. You are awakened by a fresh breeze blowing towards you. You dizzily get to your feet, pick up the egg, and hurry toward the fresh air. Outdoors again in Snake Canyon. No way! Everything is as you remember it, and in a few hours you are walking up to the ranch where your uncle says he is surprised you got back so quickly. 
when you tell what has happened to you, no one at the ranch believes it. Man, we found a random dude from the colonies in a cave who believed us, and our own uncle won't believe us. This sucks. This is but I... <laughs> <laughs> When you tell what has happened to you, no one at the ranch believes it, though they are fascinated by your enormous egg. Okay. <laughs> Cave a tiny little we'll much, be- but that giant egg, tell me more. Oh my gosh. Maybe we'll believe that egg is real and believe your story if it will hatch a monster, your uncle says, or if you break it open and show us what's inside. <laughs> do we decide to break the egg open or do we keep it in our closet until we have a chance to get scientific advice? I'm begging you to go for the scientific advice. I want to hatch that hey, monster. Hatch that monster. Okay. Maybe this the will ne- be the one we get burned at the st- <laughs> 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 The next day, you call the Department of Zoology at a nearby university. When you are referred to Dr. Henry Karn, a specialist in large reptiles. Dr. Karn is skeptical about the egg, but agrees to drive to Red Creek Ranch immediately to see it. By the time he arrives, you are feeling very nervous. Suppose the egg is just made of plastic. Your concern is heightened by his stern appearance. He shakes hands brusquely with you and your uncle and immediately asks to see the egg. When you hand it to him, he says nothing while he stares intently at it, holds it up to the light, taps it and scratches it with a penknife. Then he holds it to his ear. Finally, he smiles at you and gently puts the egg down. It's quite possible that this egg is the egg of a plesiosaurus, an aquatic dinosaur of the late Jurassic period. It is highly unlikely it will ever hatch. Even so, I would want to keep it in an incubator at the university for at least a year before breaking it open. I'll let you know, of course, if anything develops. A few weeks have passed since then, and whenever the phone rings, you wonder if Dr. Karn is calling. The end. It won't even confirm it for us? Are you kidding me? (laughs) We went through all that effort. We went through time. We picked, like, the perfect path to get a Loch Ness pet, and it just doesn't give it to us. It's just, and then it might. The end. Have fun in your boring life without the Loch Ness Monster. Sometimes I wonder. Maybe he's calling. Who's the author? Who's the author? <laughs> I'm going to mark this down as Thomas Anger. Who's the author? Tell... I'm looking it up. I have forgotten his name. Edward Packard. Are you alive, Edward Packard? I don't oh, think so. Edward Packard, if you're listening to this podcast, we are not trying to threaten your life. <laughs> no, that's not a threat. He's 91 years he's old. He's 91. He went to Princeton. Uh, well, he knows something then about uh, being a... Jurassic reptile professor. <laughs> no, he was a lawyer. Oh, a lawyer. <laughs> well, then he should know how a courtroom proceeding works, at least. We should have gotten burned at the stake. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's see. Back to the last decision point. Do we decide to break the egg open? Yes, and I would like to formally apologize to Edward Packard. I got a little worked up there. We love your book, uh, and we will continue to enjoy your books, I'm sure. <laughs> With your aunt and uncle and some ranch hands standing by, you gently tap the egg with an axe, hoping it will split open without fragmenting. Wait a minute, Uncle Howard cries out. I'm ready to believe you, but I think we better get a naturalist down from the university to see this first. Isn't that what we just did in the other path? You are relieved that your uncle feels this way because it seems like a terrible responsibility, cracking open an egg like that and possibly killing a rare monster before it is born. Uncle Howard calls the naturalist, a famous professor of paleontology, who agrees to come down the following Saturday. You place the egg in a large bowl in the middle of the dining room table. The next day is Friday, and that evening the whole family goes out to the movies. When you return, you find the house has been broken into and the egg is missing. Neither you, your aunt and uncle, nor any of the ranch hands, nor the police are ever able to find the egg. Most people you tell your story to just smile and say, sure. But Uncle Howard, even though he's a skeptical man, tells you he knows you were telling the truth. The end. That makes me sad. Skunk. This is the sad ending. Skunk. Yeah. Skunk, skunk. Yeah. Sad skunk. That one didn't even make me laugh. You lost the one thing that you gained from the Cave of Time. The end. Just bummed me out. The way to bring the realities of mankind's cruelty into this story here. I I, I, I think it looked like they got broken into, but I think what really happened is the egg hatched and the monster broke out. Causing Mm. all that that mess. You know, we can't find the egg because the guy in the egg left. I think... Ultimately, even though we only went to one time period, I think the best route we've gotten so far has been going into the cave, going to medieval times, meeting the king, finding Loch Ness Monster, getting the egg, coming back, getting it to the university. That's like a pretty good journey. That's pretty adventurous. Got to see a lot of stuff. And he actually ends up back home. And you end up back home with something to show for it, you know? Mm-hmm. I kind of wish we'd gone to like two or three time periods, but it's a pretty big journey to get arrested by a king, jump out into a moat, become a fisherman on Lake Loch Ness, see the Loch Ness monster, find out it's actually a dinosaur that travels through time. 
That's a lot. I mean, time traveling dinosaurs is pretty darn cool, I gotta say. I mean, these endings, logistically speaking, they make sense as the good endings because, you know, we made it back to our own time period, but they're just like the least satisfying endings. <laughs> it is It is boring that we don't find out what happened to the egg. I'll, I'll give you that. Is there, I mean, there's a, a few choices we've had leading up to this point, you know, in regards to the Loch Ness Monster. I'm optimistic that one of these at least gives us something regarding... Nessie. Yeah, so we cannot try to find the Cave of Time. Let's not try. I want to see if the Loch Ness Monster comes back. You're about okay. to live out a beautiful life as a fisherman. <laughs> All right. The idea that the Loch Ness Monster goes into the Cave of Time for a hundred years or so before returning seems preposterous. And even if it does, it seems very doubtful you could dive down deep enough to find the underwater entrance. So you resign yourself to make a living fishing the waters of oh, Loch Ness. Oh, my word. You find it a tolerable, though if not interesting, life. You particularly like rowing out in your skiff in the early morning mists and watching the pale red sun struggling to shine through the haze. That's what you are doing one day when you feel a tremendous thump under your boat. The stern is heaved high into the air oh. and you are hurled over the bow and no. into the jaws of the monster. No. <laughs> oh yeah, we get to live out our life. And then we get so, eaten by the Loch Ness Monster. <laughs> some of your friends find the wreckage of your boat later in the day and throughout the village, people say to each other, the monster has returned again. The end. Wait, that's so good. What? We got eaten by Nessie. Yeah. <sighs> That is, uh, that goes under the death column, but it's one of our best ones. <laughs> I mean, getting eaten by a myth. Holy cow. We we do currently have better than death, though we did die. We'll just call this good death. A good, good death. I mean, we're going to have a category for every ending at this point. Mm -hmm. Well, we do have three categories with multiple marks in them. We have two regular deaths. We have two missed potentials and we have two Shyamalans. Dang. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> oh, man. man. Well, we did get eaten by the Loch Ness Monster. Uh, I just really want to see if we can manage to get burned at the stake, though. We can do this still. We can die at the stake. I guarantee it. Yeah. I'm not. Okay. I'm skeptical. Okay. The last decision point before that is whether we stay and become fishermen on Loch Ness or deciding to travel on. So... Let's try that one out. You'd rather spend the rest of your life searching for the entrance to the Cave of Time than settle for the placid life of a fishing village. So you bid your new friends farewell and set out over the countryside, heading south for London. Your goal is to find a ship to take you to America, though you know America hasn't been discovered yet, for somehow you must find your way back to Red Creek Canyon and the Cave of Time. A few hours later, as you are walking on the road along the edge of the forest, some burly men ride out from behind a clump of trees. We've got you, one shouts. You're the one who escaped from the tower, aren't you? <gasps> they force you upon a horse and ride at top speed toward the castle. The penalty for escaping from the tower is hanging, one of them oh. tells you. You find out he is right. The end. You were so close. It was so, 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 so close. We got killed, so upside. We did not get burned at the stake, downside. Yeah, I'll mark this one as a non-flammable execution. Categories are getting ridiculous, man. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's a bit. That's a bit specific. Yeah, we're we're so close. I f with with how close we've gotten here. This is the closest we've gotten. I do feel like there is some potential. So let's keep flipping back. I think that takes us back to believable lie to the king. Yes. So let's try to make up a plausible story for the king. That's probably a good idea. I'm sorry to have intruded upon your royal domain, your majesty, you say humbly, trying to think up a good story as fast as you can. It is true, sire, I have been badly mistreated by my wicked stepfather with whom I live, and I place myself under your wise and just protection. Who is this wicked stepfather and where does he live? The king asks. If he is wicked enough, we may want him to be one of our knights, he adds laughing <laughs> as do all the courtiers. He's a cartoon villain! <laughs> if he's evil oh enough, he could be our oh knight! Oh my god! <laughs> He lives beyond that hill, you say, <laughs> pointing to a war, pointing toward a high wooded ridge, and his name is Smith. The king laughs once again. Then your stepfather must be a fish, he says, for beyond yonder hill is Loch Ness. Off to the tower, the king shouts. <laughs> 
I okay. do not know what's oh going on. Oh my gosh. Two knights leap forward, drag you out of the chamber, and with spears at your back, force you to climb 48 stone steps to the tiny... Okay, yeah. So we... Either way, we were going to end up in the tower, regardless of what we said to the king. Boo. Do the tower options change once we're up there? Uh, nope. The tower, tower options are exactly the same. Oh, so that's weird. Like, if you, most of these fork off into a completely different thing, but this one actually brings you back to the same point. Boo. Yeah. That's interesting. It's not even an ending, technically. It's just another path. Ah, <sighs> man. Well, we got... In a few different places, we got very, very, very close to being burned at the stake. I think it's not meant to be. At least not on this path in the cave yeah. of time. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, I think, you know, we've had a fun time with the cave of time, but the fact that we can't get burned at the stake makes me feel like maybe it's time for this particular story to get laid to rest. I'm, I'm going to spoil something real quick for myself. I'm going to look it up and see if you can, like, what the endings are. I want to see if burnt at the stake <laughs> is an option. Oh my gosh. Look through all this Choose Your Own Adventure books for the next bonus episode, man, and look for any that have uh, anything I, to yeah. do with witchcraft. I have. It's not to do with witchcraft. I'll start there. But I remember as a youth, I had an Animorphs Choose Your Own Adventure book, and I'm pretty sure it's still at my mom's house. If you wanted to do an Animorphs one. Mm. That would be Holy cool. Holy cow. You know, we did get a request from one of our patrons to do Sonic Adventure Game Book 2 Zone Rangers. Uh, oh. which has also been done on 8-Bit Book Club. Here's the problem. We managed to get Metal City Mayhem for like 23 bucks, but Zone Rangers is going for like over 100 bucks everywhere I've been able to find it. And so here, here's the thing, actually. I'll, I'll send out an SOS, as ABBA would say to all of our listeners. If you want to hear Sonic the Hedgehog Adventure Game Book 2 Zone Rangers, we have a Kofi account. You can give us a one-time donation and we will put that money towards <laughs> buying this $100 book. And if we get enough, oh then we will buy the book. I'll use it as a tax write-off because I can do self-employment taxes now. And we will read that book for you as a bonus episode. Uh, I gotta I gotta tell you something, guys. I'm looking at this, this person who's... He hasn't told all the endings, but he's like given a review of The Cave of Time. And here's a direct quote from the book, okay? You are curious to try the next tunnel you come to thinking that it may show the state of the world just before it began to burn up from the intensifying heat of the dying sun, or that it might show what happened afterward. Okay. But you suspect that a tunnel further on might be more likely to lead you back to your own time. So that it seems like it's possible that we could burn on the planet rather than at the stake. I mean, it's burning <laughs> of some variety at least. Also fun fact, if you Google CYOA Cave of Time, we are the fourth result. Hey, Us? there we go. Holy cow. Yeah. <laughs> Why? <laughs> at least what? on my Google. Jeez. Look at that SEO. Bonus, the Cave of Time, CYOA Part 1, Improv Tabletop. Man, we're we're killing it with our SEO game. Look at that. <laughs> it's ridiculous. <laughs> okay, so I found on the Internet Archive a full text version of the Cave of Time, searched for burn, and the only result I got was the one that Thomas just mentioned. It's just not faded. No one's burning at the stake in this book. <sighs> wow, Ned. I clicked on the link in this new redesign of the Improv Tabletop website. Oh, yeah, really that happened good. because Podbean got rid of the theme that we were using and just switched us to a different one. Oh. Uh, I was trying to give a little plug for the new website, but it looks <laughs> no, like it's well, bad news. Oops. This, the one that it ended up as <laughs> is not the one that they randomly switched us to. It is one that I chose and decided to put a little bit of extra effort into. So it is a compliment. Thank you, Evan. You're welcome. I the old one was good. But. This new one is even better because it has a picture of a man wearing a wolf mask. It does. Who is that handsome devil, Ned? Where can I find out all I need to about that wonderful, cool character in the wolf mask? Whoever plays him is probably really great. Well, if you wish to hear the exploits of Si Wei Lang, otherwise known as the Wolf, one of the masked spirits, you can check out our ongoing Blades in the Dark campaign, ImpTab Avatar Blades in the Dao Fei. And uh, let's see. Well, we're in plug territory. Might as well read through my script. I've actually got a script this time, guys. Look at wow, that. Wow, look Whoa. at you. 
How professional. It only took you a year and a <laughs> yeah. half of podcast. If, if you want more of this high quality, well planned content, go ahead and subscribe, <laughs> maybe even leave us a review. We would be as happy as someone who got eaten by the Loch Ness monster if you go ahead and give us a review on the podcatcher of your choice. We're also all over social media at Improv Tabletop. So if you'd like to connect with us there, you know, maybe you want to suggest another choose your own adventure book, or maybe you want to just reach out to me personally with a cash donation so that I can buy the book Sonic the Hedgehog Adventure Game Book 2 Zone Rangers, then don't be afraid to reach out. That's such a hor- that's such a horrible <laughs> it's use a of money. It's a very guys. horrible use of money. <laughs> Look, it's such the, a bad this, investment. We're doing this for the patrons. If the patrons want it, we'll do it. Oh. And some bookseller over across the pond will be very happy to get 100 or so US dollars in exchange for this child's book. That's crazy. But as far as other stuff you can hear on this channel, we've got our fake campaigns, 15 of those spanning across a wide variety of topics and themes. It's almost like we walked into the cave of time and each time we walked out, we ran into a different fake campaign. We've also got <laughs> Imptab Avatar 10,000 Things, our first full length campaign. That one was super fun. We've got Imptab Avatar Blades in the Dao Fei, which is currently running. If you hang around here, you'll find that pretty soon. We also have a sister podcast called iCast Fireball, D&D 5 actual play going through the campaign tyranny of dragons and when we finally finish that campaign and start doing something else it's going to feel real weird because that's kind of become part of our identity but we'll figure (laughs) out what happens when we reach that point we are also an affiliate with fanrolldice.com if you buy some awesome dice on there and use coupon code vroom vroom fifi that is fifi spelled f-i-f-i you can get 10 percent off your purchase And uh, aside from that, thanks everybody for joining us here in the Cave of Time for all of our many justifiable guilts and better than deaths and sad skunks that we've experienced here. Until next time, I have been Ned Wilcock, your person who reads a lot of words, and today I've been joined by... Thomas Ryan, I don't have anything creative. And Evan Peterson, from the belly of the Loch Ness Monster. Oh, that's a good one. Much love and stuff, everybody. We'll catch you next time on Improv Tabletop. And scene. I'm ending this recording.